You're listening to 91 Reasons, a journey into the twisted landscape of pop culture. Keep your hands and arms inside the podcast at all times. And now, The Voice, Jeff Tucker. Everybody, it's Jeff. We're going to delve back into history on this show. But before we uh, take our excursion, just wanted to give a thanks to uh, Tim Wilson, who sent me a DVD. I put a list on Facebook of movies I was looking for and offered to pay for it. And Tim was like, no, 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 I love your show. And let me send you this disc, which is great. It's a disc of The Thing. John Carpenter's The Thing. Just one of those, you know, you ever look in your, your DVD collection? And I have, you know, a massive DVD collection. And you go, well, I'm just missing key titles. And because I'm missing them, I don't watch them enough. Uh, And I haven't seen the thing in years and years. So uh, I'm excited to watch that thanks to Tim. He also sent me a nice letter. And the gist of the letter is the crux of this show. And that's, hey, we're all in this together. And no matter where we grew up or the circumstances, a lot of us grew up the same. You know, idolizing uh, movies and directors, having problems at school, and dealing with bullies, and trying to get the girl, and failure, and failure, and failure, and then suddenly, success, right? So, big thanks to Tim, and if you want to check out Tim, he has a, a podcast called The Civil Gore Podcast, so go on iTunes and check out Civil Gore Podcast. I'm going to check it out. I think it's about horror movies, because it says... Tune in to the horror at iTunes. And hey, I love horror movies. I'm not an expert at them, uh, but I do love movies in general, and horror movies are are fantastic. But uh, speaking of horror movies, hey, uh, a couple years ago, I had the fortune, thanks to Sean Merrick, to perform at the Improv down in Hollywood. I did a live uh, episode of 91 Reasons, I had a nice audience, Uh, we bought some drinks, and I did the Don Berg nonsense live uh, with, for the first time ever, uh, cursing. And I was really, I wasn't nervous to do it because I don't really get nervous, but I was hesitant to do it because my wife is always railing on me that 91 Reasons is a family show and cursing isn't allowed. Uh, and I, 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 I stick to that. And, you know, she curses every once in a while on the show. But I had never really let loose with, you know, pure emotion about Don Berg. Uh, but I did on that one. And I got a lot of positive feedback. Uh, a guy who's become a really good friend, Noel, told me it was better with cursing. And I was like, oh, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, but I, you know, I don't fancy myself a stand-up comedian, although I, I have done stand-up before. And doing the Don Berg stuff at, at a club setting is, you know, it's, it's, it's stand-up-ish, if that makes sense. But during that show, I mentioned the next chapter of my idiot life. And that was moving out of Norwalk. And, the I mean, the absolute insanity that ensued. I mean, look if you look at the stages of my life... As you can tell, I've got my my hands on my face, like, exasperated. You know? Um, I I grew up in the 70s in a a home of divorce. My mother divorced her second husband, my stepdad. And then when she wanted to make herself feel better, she brought in the drunks from Tennessee. And when that finally filtered out and they all basically died she brought in Don Berg and so from 85 to 92 I endured Don Berg in the small town of Norwalk 
Norwalk was my home. It's where I grew up. I'm a graduate of Norwalk High. Yeah, go Lancers. Like, I care. Um, <clears throat> but Norwalk just seemed like this is where I'm going to spend my life. Now, my mother bought that house that we lived in, 14017 Studebaker Road. Uh, the phone number was 213-863-6621. That's how nonsensical I am. Uh, she bought that house in the 70s. Uh, it was $80,000, and by the time uh, 89, 90, 91 rolled around, it was worth a, considerably more than that. You know, property values in California just keep going up and up and up and up. They only fell uh, during the financial meltdown of 2009, 2010. Other than that, property in California just goes up. So I had this idea like, well, my mom's probably just going to pay the house off. And when she decides to move in with Berg somewhere in a, in a pile of junk, I'll take the house over and I'll just pay her or I'll pay the bank until it's paid off. Well, that didn't happen because what happened was Berg decided he needed a fleet of tow trucks. Not one, a fleet. He needed four or five tow trucks because he was going to open a towing business. That's what I'm going to open a tow business, Jockey. Okay, that's great, Berg. But he did it by putting a second mortgage on my mother's house and borrowing against it. So by the time he got the four or five tow trucks, my mother was back in the hole, I think, $300,000 in that house. So I wasn't going to get it. I mean, I could have. I could have afforded it if I'd had I mean, I was working at Blockbuster Video at the time. or I had to, Actually, excuse me. I was working at Spencer Gifts at the time. Uh, I was assistant manager. But I wasn't making the kind of money that I could afford a house payment like that. Not even in 92. So my mom, seeing the writing on the wall, um, wanted to move. And I was okay with that. I was like, you know, I, we can move. Uh, you know, eventually I'm going to find a place and move out on my own. I mean, that was the plan. It's everybody's plan, right? Now, my mom worked at a place called Bronco Roofing. Uh, she worked for this nut named uh, something Bronco. And uh, she was his main receptionist secretary. He, he, um, he used to commute pretty far to work every day. He bought a mannequin and he used to drive around with the mannequin so he could use the carpool lane. And he would like dress the mannequin up in different outfits. Like, I, I've, I've driven in traffic. We've all had the dream of, you know, if there was a person sitting there, I, I'd be home already. But I never never thought, of, you know, that I got to the point where I wanted the mannequin in the car, in the, in the seat next to me. So he had a mannequin. But she worked for him, and that put her all over the city because they did roofing, and you have to pull a permit from the city when you want to do somebody's roof. You know, there's a lot of paperwork involved. So she found herself at the Buena Park City Hall on Beach Boulevard pulling roofing permits. And that's when, across the street, she saw a gigantic mansion. Not a big house, but a mansion. It was uh, overgrown with uh, ivy and weeds. It was behind a flimsy, rickety uh, chain link fence. But somewhere in there was a diamond in the rough mansion. So she figured, hey, I'm going to find out you know, what that is. She asked people at the city, and they told her, yeah, it's owned by some Texas oil billionaire. But it's just been rotting there ever since the last tenants, the last owners, uh, died. So no one's been in there in years. So my mom <clears throat> uh, got a realtor who, you know, called somebody and called somebody and finally got a tour of this place. And my mom, being from the South, being from Chattanooga, Tennessee, she fell in love with this house. And this house was, is massive. It has 11 bedrooms. It has uh, three bathrooms, two kitchens. Uh, it has a um, uh, servant's quarters in the back. I mean, this is just a massive piece of property, especially in Orange County. 
So my mom takes the tour. She falls in love. She finally gets the oil billionaire from Texas on the phone, who I imagine is like the guy for The Simpsons. He's like, yeehaw, little lady. You want to buy the house? So she actually made a deal with this guy to buy this house. This is 1992. She bought the house. Now think about this. The house I just described to you. Two stories, massive Potential uh, commercial property because it had a zoning permit for a, a retail antique store in it. And she paid $500,000 for it. Now, in 92, that was a lot of money. Nowadays, uh, there's a house I looked at a couple of blocks from me that looks like um, hobos live in it, you know, with sticks and handkerchiefs. And it's 542000 because of where it is. So I would I would guess that that house on Beach Boulevard is now at least 2 million. But back then it was 500,000. So my mother made arrangements to buy it. And she came home one day and she goes, "Jeffrey, I I bought a house." And I said, "Ma, we already got a house." No, no, no. I bought a big house in Buena Park and we're going to move there. And I thought, "Well, okay, that's great. I um I work at the Buena Park Mall, so this will be great. You know, I won't have to commute very far uh, to the mall to go to Spencer Gifts to work. So she started the paperwork on this thing, and it, it took a long time. It took months and months and months. And I remember one day she just goes, yeah, we got it. We're moving. So her and Berg um, picked up and moved. Now, we were living in Norwalk at the time. And we had an empty room because my sister had moved out. She had started her family already. And we had an empty room that she was renting to a guy. Uh, his name was his name was Tim. But he changed his name to Timberwolf. And we used to call him Timberwolf because that's what he liked to be called. And Timberwolf um, worked at Service Merchandise. Do you remember Service Merchandise? Where you walked around and saw stuff in a, in a glass case and then ordered it and it came down, this, down the, uh, the, the, the conveyor belt. They turned, maybe it was best products because I think at the end, best turned into that. Anyways, he was bringing home bicycles to resell because they'd been scratched and dented out of the system. Uh, I, I think it turned out he was scratching and denting them. I, I don't know. I don't know really what happened. I just remember there was a guy named Timberwolf living in the room next to me. So when we moved, she told Timberwolf he had to go. So Timberwolf took off. He did not follow to the Buena Park house. But the cool thing was Berg and my mom moved out. And there was about two or three weeks where I had the house to myself, where I would go to work, come home, and the house was mine. And so I threw a bunch of parties. I had my... What, the improv team came over and we partied it up. There was wine coolers and bags of pretzels and PG-13 antics. That's pretty much all it was. And then finally the day came, uh, I had to move. I remember my mom called me, she goes, today's the day you're moving. And I said, okay. She, she sent a guy from the roofing company to help me. So this guy named Porfirio, who didn't speak hardly any English, came over, and he helped me move my stuff. So I, was, I, I tipped him and everything. It was great. But I ended up in this weird house in Buena Park, um, and I, it, it was so surreal. Like, the room was huge. It had a little tiny room connected to it. I'm going to put a video up on YouTube, and I'm going to link to it. You can actually take a walkthrough of the house because they did that with a video camera. And you can see it before it was restored. Like, you can see the condition we bought it in, which was pretty bad. None of the rooms had any uh, light fixtures. We had to bring in lamps and uh, wire in our own lights. But I remember moving in and it was weird. The first crazy thing was I got transferred to Cerritos Mall, Spencer Gifts. So my commute stayed the same. I just switched cities. But I asked my mother, I said, look, there's all this, this is a big house. And she was making a big payment every month. 
I, I think the payment was like close to $5,000, you know, and this is, this is in 1992, remember. So I said, how are we going to afford this? You know, I'll do my part, but my part's pretty dinky compared to what you got to pay to keep us up on this thing. And she said, oh no, I'm going to rent out all the rooms. Now, the house we moved in was built in 1875 or 1885, something like that. I think 75. And it was the Stage Stop Hotel in Buena Park. It was the overnight stay. If you boarded a stagecoach in Los Angeles and you wanted to go to the beach, you stopped overnight at the stage stop before you continued on to the beach. So it was a hotel. And when we took ownership of it, it was full of antiques, furniture, old newspapers, all kinds of crazy stuff. And we'd always had the idea that we were going to open an antique store in the commercial part of the property. But that would take a while. Uh, the first thing was my mother had to fill it with wackos. Now, <laughs> my mother had no shortage of wackos around her. My mom, my house, my mom's house growing up for my brother was the hangout place. Everybody hung out there. My brother would have 15 people at a time there. Then the drunks moved in and there were 15 drunks at a time. And then Berg came and I wasn't staying there, so I hung out someplace else, anywhere but home. But my mother had grown accustomed to living in this circus of insanity. In fact, I think the reason she died was that the circus ended. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So she started filling it with wackos. She started filling it, and I say wacko as a term of endearment. These were originally the cast offs of society people who couldn't afford an apartment, people who an apartment wouldn't rent to them. Um, and some just dug the vibe. So. My friend Daniel Rappelhofer moved in. He rented a room because Dan had a weird story. And Dan's a good guy. But Dan was one of those guys where on his 18th birthday, his mother got him a cake and a suitcase and said, I'm done being your parent. Time to go. So he moved in. And uh, we had a whole host of people. So I took a room on the second floor. My mom and uh, Berg took a room on the bottom floor. And they would eventually move over to what was supposed to be one of the, the giant sitting rooms. But my, my mother turned it into a gigantic bedroom. And when I say bedroom, think about movies where the king is in a, in, in a lair, in a bedroom, and the bed... Like, in, our, in most of our rooms, the bed takes up most of the room. And that's the, your room holds your bed and maybe a dresser, and if you're lucky, a desk. Uh, my mother's bedroom held... A bed, a dining room table, a, a giant screen TV, you know, three or four tape. I mean, it was just massive. And there were fireplaces in every room, even though none of them worked. They were for decoration only. There was a fireplace in the living room that had a door behind it, like a secret passage. So Berg and her are on the bottom floor. I'm on the top floor. Rappelhofer takes a room on the top floor. And then people just start to move in. Um, I made a list because I, I didn't want to forget anybody. Uh, we had these two twin guys. Uh, I called them the Twidiots because they were twin idiots. Uh, but they, uh, they were middle-aged guys. And their story was they shared a wife. So in one room, there were two balding older men and one wife. I don't remember their names, but I remember like, What's going on in there? Are you kidding me? Weird. My friend Marabeth moved in. She was uh, in the improv group with me. Now, Marabeth was the one that just dug the vibe. She just wanted a place that was cool where she could be with friends. And she took the servants' quarters in the back because it was a full apartment in the back with a bedroom, a little kitchenette, and a bathroom. Uh, all of the other rooms in the house were just, you know, straight... Uh, hotel rooms with share, with one shared bathroom on the second floor and two on the bottom floor. 
So, again, all these people start moving in. Maribeth's in the back house. Uh, this guy, Tony, took the room next to the um, antique store. There was an antique store room, which we would open later. And then right on the back of that was this little tiny room, big enough for a bed and like a table. And when, the, when we took, took control of the house, there was um, a lot of paperwork that that room contained a giant painting of cats and people would pay a quarter to see the painting of cats. The, the painting wasn't there. I, we saw pictures of it in the newspaper. Why you would pay a quarter to see it, I have no idea. But like, this was like stepping through the looking glass. This was like, even though P.T. Barnum wasn't physically there, his spirit was there in this weird, weird house. And the circus came to town, man. The circus came to town. Another room was taken in by this guy uh, who he, had, he was a dad with two sons. I don't remember his name or one of the sons' name, but the other guy's name was Jay. And we all remember Jay because Jay got a job at Disneyland as Goofy. So we just used to call him Goofy, right? And Jay's thing was he liked to run around the house in uh, uh, spandex bicycle shorts, which drove my mother crazy because you could see every outline of, of his body, if you know what I mean. And my mother would just go, Jay, put some pants on. You know, and eventually my brother moved into the top floor, took over the entire back half of the house. It was him, his wife Angie, her kids, Gallo, Amanda, Gabriel, and then Angie's mother and father. I mean, these the numbers are stacking up, folks. They're stacking up. We had a woman who lived there who um, worked nights. We're not sure what she did, but we do know she would leave her, inf not infant, but uh, toddler daughter alone. And we don't, we don't know where she went. And we would always go, look, you can't leave your kid. We're not responsible for your kid. I have to go to work. Well, you have to figure something out. I mean, we had, we had chaos, right? And the whole time all these people are moving in, we're trying to renovate the house because certain rooms need painting. Every room needs lighting, um, carpet, uh, cleaning, scrubbing. The backyard was overrun with tumbleweeds, actual tumbleweeds and junk. You know, Berg was in heaven. He opened the garage and just filled it with all of his crap. And then anything in the house that was not nailed down, he would just take. The room that uh, Daniel ended up in was on the bottom floor, was really like a closet. Tiny, tiny room. And it was next to one of those under the stairs rooms, like Harry Potter. And in there we opened up and found all these old newspapers and books and stuff. Like every time we turned around, there was more weirdness in the house, right? And this, again, all of this is going on. We're moving in all these people. We're renovating the house hardcore. And, and Berg. You're still dealing with Berg every single day. Except now he's in his element because the house is full of junk. And you're going to help, Jeffrey. Okay, I want to go out there and get the, the antique store. It's got to get ready to get open. Because we had this idea we were going to open this antique store. And we were going to make tons of money. And that was going to pay the rent, right? That way, if any of the, the, the tenants didn't pay or my mother wanted the tenants out, she had a backup plan. Plus, my mom just liked living in chaos. She thrived on it. Uh, there was a woman that would come to the door about once a week on a bicycle. You know, she was one of those um, methamphetamine, meth heads. Is, is, is your mother home? I'm looking for Jackie. Ma, that woman's at the door for you. Why, why do you deal with her? I just need to talk to Jackie. And my mother would buy jewelry from her. I don't know where the jewelry came from or antiques. Like the woman would like ride her bike over with a lamp. I brought this lamp. I was hoping to get ten dollars. My mom would give her ten bucks and buy the lamp. You know. I never understood any of my mother's uh, behavior until she passed away. And then at her funeral, there were so many people there you couldn't find a seat. I was like, oh, I finally get it. 
you know, uh, life and existence is not measured in wealth. It's measured in how many lives you touch. And my mother touched so many lives that the funeral was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Uh, but again, we're getting ahead of ourselves. My mother moved in a guy named Nabil. Now, Nabil was Middle Eastern, and Nabil, Nabil showed up. He was a, um, he drove an ice cream truck. So, he was a nice guy, and every time you saw him, he'd go, Oh, hello. You want some ice cream? I go, hey, Nabil, how's it going? I have ice cream. We know you have ice cream. You drive it. It's parked in the back. Come get the ice cream. Yes. So, my he would have my, you know, give my mother a push pop. And he would hand out ice cream to everybody. Yeah, have a drumstick. Yes, the drumstick, right? So every day he would get up and he would go drive the truck around and sell ice cream. And one day he comes in and he's he's pissed off. Hey, Nabil, what's wrong? Now, my, my sister's husband at the time, Scott, would sing as loud as he could, I'm the barber of Nabil. Like, what are you doing? Don't contribute to the chaos in this house. So Nabil comes home and he's very angry. And I go, Nabil, what's wrong? He goes, the, the ice cream truck. Yeah, what's wrong with your ice? No one tells me. Permit? You have to have permit? I said, you don't have a permit? What is permit? I said, Nabil, you have to have a permit to sell ice cream. No, no, no. You buy truck, you have ice cream, you sell ice cream. No, Nabil, you have to have a permit in the city to sell ice a seller's permit. I have no idea. So he had to get out of the ice cream business. So he had ice cream for weeks because he couldn't he couldn't sell it. <laughs> and I just, you know, you, each of these, you can look at one way. You can look at like, what, what am I doing here? Why is this happening to me? Or as a life lesson, and we just took all this in stride as a life lesson. You know, Maribeth was a smoker. Now, I, I've never smoked, but I don't mind people who smoke. So the house is right on Beach Boulevard. It's in the height of all the action, right? So we would have these things called porch parties. Hey, Maribeth would go, hey, I'm going to smoke. You want to go do a porch party? And we would just hang out on the porch for like an hour, watch the traffic go by, watch pedestrians go by, and just, just, just be you know, this is before cell phones, before the internet, when the primary way you hung out with people was you actually, I know, gasp, hung out with people. You just hung out with them. And that's the way, you know, that's the way it was. And it was great. You know, I would go to work every morning. I'd come back and I would enter into chaos every day. You know, that was the whole, that's where we had the whole street sweeping thing where I said, hey, Berg, I just want to warn you about the street sweeping. Don't you warn me, punk. And that's where we had the fight about when I went to uh, San Francisco for that drama competition. And that's why you lost the drama thing, because you're not any good. I'm like, every day we would fight and we lived in this house. The only good part was, unlike the house in Norwalk, you could get away from Berg. The house was big enough to get away. There was a uh, parking lot next door and then a church. We would go to the church to the thrift store they had there, which was pretty cool. And um, eventually they moved a uh, historical house next door to us. Like we got up at two in the morning and watched them drive a house down the street. Uh, but within the chaos of the house and all these people living here. And there was weird things to the house too. Uh, the upstairs bathroom didn't have a door. So we had all these signals, a light, a little sign that said, hey, we're in here, you can't come in the bathroom. There's somebody in here, go downstairs. <clears throat> um, the stairs were very narrow because they were made for a different time and a different uh, body type of person. My mother put a grand piano in the living room down front. And occasionally it would play by itself, even though it wasn't that kind of piano. One time a little girl came over and when she left with her mom, she said, oh, I want to go say goodbye to my friend. And there was nobody there. 
So it had its share of ghost stories, but mostly it was just filled with chaos and wackiness. And with two kitchens, two kitchens. Oh, you know what? I just forgot. There was a bathroom off the kitchen. So there was four bathrooms total. I for totally forgot. There's a little tiny bathroom off the kitchen. Um, and then a little tiny, what was supposed to be a pantry, but my mother turned into her closet. And I remember painting vines and flowers on the wall for her to, you know. This th this was my mother's passion project. She was going to live the rest of her life there. And it almost, that almost came true. And eventually, uh, I brought Rachel over to the house. I met, I met Rachel and... I wanted to impress her. So when she came over, my friend Steve and I were playing Frisbee on the second floor. The hallway was so long, you could actually play Frisbee down it. And so we were playing Frisbee. Um, we filmed a music video there. And uh, then this girl Tiffany moved in that I went to high school with. And Rachel and Tiffany had hit it off. And Rachel moved in with Tiffany. And then moved in with me like a week later. So... I credit the house, the beach house, with accelerating my relationship with Rachel. I don't know. I mean, we would have dated and gotten married, but we did it pretty quick because we lived together almost immediately. It was weird. I went from this gawky, angry guy who couldn't get a girl to this girl moved in, and I credit Rachel with all that. By the time she met me, I was a wreck. Women had destroyed me, and she was going to put me back together. And she did, to her credit. She totally did. Um, and the house went through these weird stages where uh, a room got empty, so I filled it with Star Wars toys. And then my mother needed the revenue, so I moved the toys over. Um, Rachel and I got married there. We uh, painted a, a, an aisle in the back. And through a gigantic party in 94, and we got married in that backyard. And eventually we opened an antique store, the Stage Stop Antiques. Probably around 93 we opened that. Uh, the city came over and we did a ribbon cutting ceremony with the mayor. And the store was open. And at the time, I got, this is when Cerritos Spencer Gifts went out of business. So I didn't have a job for a year. I was on unemployment. So I would run the antique store all day, which meant I would just sit there all day. I wrote scripts while I sat there, and people, you know, occasionally people would come in. Not very often. We did okay on the weekends. Um, and the store made a little money and did okay for at least a couple of years. And then life just sort of ebbs and flows, you know, and people move in and people move out. And there were more characters, and with Nobil, and this is this is the house where, you know, Berg, who had gotten that fleet of tow trucks, people would call and go, "Yeah, I'm looking for a tow," and it was like three in the morning. No, 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 not tow now. And my mother would go, I, "I lost my house to buy you those tow trucks, but you're not going to tow anybody." No, no, no. He bought those tow trucks, a because he got caught up in a mania. And B, because the big flatbed tow trucks allowed him to move his junk around. The only person he ever towed was me when I got a big car wreck and he towed my car home. But people moved in and out. Uh, eventually the antique store closed. We decided, I mean, it just wasn't making any money. Uh, I'd, I'd gotten a job at Knott's Berry Farm, so I couldn't uh, run it all day. And we turned it into a, a two-person apartment and had this guy, this guy Damani moved in. Damani was a nice guy, you know. The problem was that Damani kept strange hours. And the way the house was set up, the mailbox was the, was the door to the antique store. You know, it had a flap and the mailman would just drop the mail in. Well, Damani was never home. And we couldn't, we couldn't get our mail. And it became this this power play between us and Damani over the mail, and we would have screaming matches with this guy. You F and F, get the F and mail. I'm not coming home till I'm coming home. We gotta do something. We would beg the mailman, can you give us the mail? No, I gotta put it here. You're not listening to us. 
Well, the mail is uh, 6603 Beach Boulevard. Yeah, that's the antique store. Well, no, we want the mail. Well, if you're in the house, you're at 6, see, the house was 6601, and the antique store was 6603. We just used the 6603 address, so all the mail went to the antique store and into Monty's lair, where it got locked away for hours. And remember, no internet, so the mail is vitally important. Bills, letters, packages. So we finally, we had to kick Damani out. We had to say, you got to go. And I told my mom, I said, I will move in to the antique store. If we're not going to run it as an antique store, I will move in. So here's what happened. It was a weird transition. Rachel and I opened a new store in that space. We opened the Glamorous Attic. It was a secondhand clothing store and collectible store. We would go to thrift stores and buy really groovy 70s and 80s outfits, and we would put them on the rack, and I had tons of action figures I had collected over the years. Here's the thing. This was about, I want to say 94 or 95, and the world just wasn't ready for that yet. I mean, now a place like that would do huge business. If we opened the Glamorous Attic now with the merchandise that we had back then, we would have trouble keeping it on the shelves. But at the time, nobody came in. People would come in, eh, it's just toys and old clothes. We're not interested. Uh, that phase, that fad hadn't come into vogue yet. We were ahead of our time with the Glamorous Attic. But, um, Eventually, that you know, we closed the, the, the glamorous attic, ran its course, and then Rachel and I turned that into an apartment, and that became our apartment, right? And that was pretty cool. But uh, here's the thing: uh, my mother moved in a guy named Keith. Now Keith was Keith was king of the wackos. I bet Keith is dead now. There's no way Keith is alive now. Keith would always call house meetings. Can we call a house meeting? And that's the way he talked. It's Keith, and I'd like to call a house meeting. Yeah, what's up, Keith? So he would gather everybody and he would go, okay, I have two questions. You know how Dwight on The Office always goes, question. Keith would always go, I have two questions. And Keith would have some issue about laundry day because we all had our own you know we had, we had a laundry day or a laundry half day like you've got the laundry facilities on tuesday until three o'clock and then somebody else gets it it's the only way to make it fair and you had i mean you had to get there and do your laundry or you missed your shot and you were down at the laundromat but keith had all these weird questions now mom moved keith in because keith had an inheritance even though he looked like you know he looked like jacob marley he had he had some dough in the in the bank, so he could pay his rent. And I think a lot of the people that my mother moved in maybe couldn't pay their rent, right? So this is 95 and moving into um, 96. Now in, late 90, in the late 95, Christmas 95, we had a great, maybe one of the best Christmases ever. You know, Rachel's mom was there. I was there. Rachel was there. We'd just been married a little over a year. And my mother had tons of money. We were always going. She um, had this saying. She'd go, I'll buy if you fly. Meaning, I'll buy food if you'll go get it. Sure, Ma, go get whatever you want. She, she loved Arby's and Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they were right next to each other, right down the road. She also liked going to Sizzler. My mother was very into Sizzler. She'd go to Sizzler a lot. Uh... And then around, I want to say it was around March of 96, my mom comes to me and she goes, uh, we have to move. And I said, what? What are you talking about? She goes, we have to move like in, in a couple of weeks. I said, in a couple of weeks? Don't we have more time? No, we have no more time. I said, mom, what's going on? She goes, um, the house is being foreclosed on. I said, I said, What? She goes, I haven't been paying the house payment in like a year. I, I mean, I, I jumped back. I said, are you kidding? She goes, yeah, I just decided to live the good life for a year. I said, are you kidding me? She goes, Jeff, how do you think I afford it? Look at all these clothes. She had, she, she had gone to her um, 
high school reunion with a whole new wardrobe, you know, and makeup. And uh, I I want to say she'd had some work done, but I don't I don't know I don't remember if that's true or not. I might be remembering that incorrectly. It doesn't matter. All I know is that for a year she had a lot of money, and it finally was explained to me. So we we had to move like overnight. We put everything in storage. We tried to find this house before the police came, you know, and they locked the door and put a chain on it. And my mother had to tell everybody, like, you know, she had to call another big house meeting. And, you know, I have two questions. No, there's no questions, Keith. It's time to go. Everybody has two weeks to get out. So, so what happened was, I mean, this is the most bizarre turn of events. What happened was everybody's got to go. So we're getting out. Everybody, one by one, is leaving. You know, it's like it's like the, the last episode of MASH. And Keith contacts the bank and figures out a way to stay there by paying a, a, a smaller payment. It's not a house payment. It's just a rent and a caretaker payment, which um, <clears throat> Handle on the Law is always talking about. The guy on the radio, if you're being foreclosed on, just call the bank and say, look, foreclose it, fine. Can I stay here for X amount of dollars? And usually, usually they'll work with you because some money is better than the property sitting empty. So what happened was we had to move. And then, you know, like anything, you go back for something. I remember going back for something and seeing that Keith was living in the living room in a tent. Like there was a pop-up tent in the living room and Keith, Mr. Two Questions, was living in a tent. It, it made no sense. It just was like, this guy's crazy. He's out of his mind. But by Easter 96, we had moved into a house in Fullerton with a pool. And it was me and Rachel, and Rachel's mom and my mom. And... This was the moment where she had left Berg. She had actually left Berg behind. And I remember checking in with her a lot, going, are you okay? You know, because Berg, you know, Berg was part of the problem. Berg was part of the issue. He would, um, he had, uh, when, you know, we found out exactly what had happened at the end. Berg was supposed to be making two to 3,000 of that monthly payment. And he wasn't paying it. He didn't. He didn't think it was fair. He had to pay his big share, and he wasn't going to pay it. So my mother, seeing that she didn't have enough for the full payment, with the rent she was collecting, decided not to pay any of it. And I, I, I kind of got that. You know, my mother was a savvy financial person. She saw that this was the easiest way out of this house. Um, just to let him foreclose on it because she was given that year of, I mean, imagine a year of not paying rent. Imagine what you could do with that money. I mean, you have to face the consequences. Now, the consequences for my mother in 96 was that by November, she had gone in for surgery, and by December, she was dead. The day after Christmas, 1996. So, in hindsight... She lived the last year of her life exactly the way she wanted to live it. With all the money she needed, her reunion, showing off to her friends, buying her loved ones whatever she wanted, and then checking out of the planet. She didn't want to go. It was not by choice. But that's how it worked out. And that's how the house on Beach Boulevard came to a close. And even though we were only there four years, like I was in Norwalk 16 years, something like that, forever, longer. But we were only at the beach house, and I call it the beach house because it was on Beach Boulevard, not because it was at the beach. We were only there four years, and yet in that four years, I started working at Knott's Berry Farm, where I still am today. I met Rachel and married her in the backyard of that house. And we, 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 we found out we were pregnant in that house. And we painted a nursery 
Winnie the Pooh Star Wars nursery, and our kid kid was going to grow up there. Didn't work out. But in that four years, I grew the hell up. I went from being an angry, bitter nerd to a happy, more centered nerd. And do I owe it to that house? I don't know. Do we owe things to the places that we are? I. Hard to say, right? Hard to say. Except that I wouldn't have gotten the job at Knott's Berry Farm if I didn't live down the street from it. You know, I don't know if I would have gotten to know Rachel as quickly as I had if she hadn't just moved in. And all of that is because of the beach house. How weird is that? We got rid of Berg when we left the beach house behind. These are big, in my life, big watershed moments. You know, all because of a structure of a house. Now, Keith lived there a couple of years before one by one everybody got kicked out or whatever. I don't know. I don't know the details. I do know that the Buena Park newspaper published a story that was pretty bad about basically calling anybody who lived there a hillbilly. And my mother's friend Janet uh, met with the reporter and set her straight and said, no, here's really what happened. And they did print a nice story about the people who lived on Beach Boulevard in an area that's not really zoned for living. It's a commercial area. And yet we we made a family there. And it was a, a big extended whack job family, but a family nonetheless. And years later, the city finally bought the house like they should have. They renovated it like they should have. And they turned it into the Chamber of Commerce. And when they opened it, they had a, you know, they have a visitor center where you can get flyers and stuff. When they opened it, they, uh, they wanted Snoopy to be there to represent Knott's Berry Farm. We took some cowboys, too. We took my good friend Jonathan. And I had been telling people for a long time, I said, you know, I used to live there. And people didn't believe me. They simply, Marty Keithley, the head of Knott's at the time, he just didn't believe me. And I brought in some pictures. I said, no, look, this is me getting married there. So I went to this event. And they had little, little booths set up for restaurants, you know, taste at Buena Park. And Snoopy was there, and the mayor was there, and um, I was sitting in the backyard, and I said, hey, Tim, and Tim's my really good friend at work. I said, Tim, come over here. He said, are you okay? I said, I am not okay, man. I have not been here in years, and we're standing on a really important spot. He said, what do you mean? I said, I got married right here. This spot is where I got married. So to be back is weird. We went into the visitor center and I lost it. I started crying. And my friend Jonathan goes, well, are you okay? I said, no. This is where my life began. This is where my life with Rachel began. This is where I found out she was going to have a baby. This is where my mom spent her last times. Yeah, we moved, but that would mean seven months. Forget about it. Four years. You know, he was sitting on the staircase that led down into the visitor center. I said, my mom sat right there where you're sitting. So to be back here is really, really weird. Eventually, we, you know, Rachel and I took the kids there. Rachel lost it. She was crying in every room, you know, to be in our old bedroom and to see the, the nursery all painted up. My old bedroom is an office now. And I asked the woman giving the tour, I said, who's in there? You know, so-and-so's in there. I said, does he know I lost my virginity in there? <laughs> he probably doesn't know, right? Um, there's a movie in there, man. The House on Beach Boulevard is a movie. All those people, all those stories, all that craziness. Four years of what it must have been like to live on a hippie commune, right? Having a porch party and Rachel moving in and like suddenly I'm living with a woman. I mean, it was so surreal. It was everything I'd ever wanted thanks to 
this crazy house my mother found. Makes me want to go visit it. I mean, we drive by it all the time, and we're always telling the kids, like, that's where mom and dad got married. That's where we fell in love at that house. It's right there. I mean, it's two minutes from here. It's so bizarre to me, right? And to be like, to, to be in the kitchen where I cook dinner, and there's a, there, instead of a stove, there's a, uh, a rack on the wall of pamphlets to go visit Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland, and all that, right? What a crazy, t I wouldn't trade those crazy times for anything. The Christmases we spent there, I mean, yeah, I had Berg, but after Rachel moved in, I finally had an ally against him. She used to fight with him as, as hard as I did. You know, and the other thing is, with all those people, he fought with everybody. So one day he would come in and zero in on my brother. Other times he'd come in and zero in on me or Rachel or whatever. Fight, 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 fight. He thrived on it until we all figured out if we just ignore him, he'll go away. Eventually he did go away. Right? The Beach Boulevard house, man. 6603 Beach Boulevard. Wow. Just Wow. And that was, um, that's how the Berg chapter ended, you know? Like most things, not with a bang, but with a whimper. We just moved away. We just left him. And for years, I didn't, I didn't even want to think about him. You know, the death of my mother was so traumatic and so sudden. Nothing else mattered. And then a month later, I was a father. My mom died December 26th, 1996. Luke was born January 25th, 1997 at the same hospital. So one floor, I'm at my mother's side watching her die. A month later, I'm with Rachel watching Luke get born. And that, my friends, is the circle of life. Yeah. I'm going to try to get Rachel's uh, thoughts on the house on Beach Boulevard. Because her, her perspective will be totally different. And she'll have different stories. But like, I would love to sit down and just write this as a, I don't, as a movie. But I don't think anybody would believe me. Right? All this craziness. Is this, is this something you can relate to? Did you ever move in with uh, 18 people? <laughs> in, a, in a hotel made for stagecoaches? My mother was crazy, and she dragged all of us along on these crazy adventures like Mr. Toad. Hey, thanks for checking out this episode of 91 Reasons. Uh, I am The Voice. I am Jeff Tucker. I am so happy that this show exists and that you people want to listen to my crazy stories. Uh, like I said, there's a video of all this. I'll try to put some videos up, and you can check out what it was like. Because we have, have videos of the 4th of July porch party. You could check out the porch party itself, man. Thanks to all those people that moved in and out of the beach house and found their lives there. And, you know, my mother um, helped them for a short time and get on their feet and move on. That's, that's what my mom, mom, that's what she did. Uh, before I worked Haunt, I know, hard to believe there was a time before I worked Haunt. There was one Halloween, 1993, that I didn't work Haunt that we threw the biggest Halloween party ever. We had a live band named Pounded Clown. Everybody showed up in costume. What a blast. New Year's Eve before I worked knots. We actually were there for the 1992 K-Rave. Remember, you probably don't even know what K-Rave is. Knots threw a rave one year. They call it K-Rave. And they had go-go dancers and rave music. And the traffic was backed up from Knott's Berry Farm all the way to our house on Beach Boulevard. And we were selling Cokes and sodas to them and hanging out and checking people out. I mean, absolute insanity. The kind of insanity you dream of repeating. You ever had that? Like, this is so crazy. I want to do this again. See, I don't know if I would. I would do it all over again, yes, because the outcome is what I'm there for. But when you're in the middle of it, man, what chaos. Hey, it's the holidays. Hope you're having a good holiday. It's almost time for the annual Sithmas Carol episodes. I got to put those back up. 
I let my friend Noel check them out. He was very impressed. So I got the Noel Cox seal of approval on those, which is fantastic. Hey, thanks for tuning in. I am Jeff Tucker. I am the voice. I know I already said that. Maybe I should say it again. Say it again, Jeff. Thanks for tuning in to what? 91 Reasons. Thanks for listening to 91 Reasons. Please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. Find us on Facebook. Is anyone even still listening?